Hello everyone, welcome to today's CBAA webinar, Developing an Effective Media Kit. Thanks to Santosh, uh, General Manager of Spots and Space for looking after today's session. You know what makes your station great, but what is the best way to convey your vision and value to prospective sponsors? That's what we'll be looking at today. Thanks so much to everyone who's joined so far and has got active in the chat. Uh, before we start, I would just I'd uh, like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which we're broadcasting, that of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay respects to elders past and present, acknowledging that sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're coming to you live via the webinar platform, live on Facebook. Santosh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Danny. Um, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging um, the, land, the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking from, which is uh, which is the Euro Nation and the Gadigal people. So uh, before we get going today, uh, next slide, please, Danny. Today, uh, we're going to have a conversation around media kits. I get asked this question all the time, um, firstly, from advertising agencies that we work with uh, regarding the media kits of the community sector and different community stations. And then I get asked about media kits from uh, community stations when we're having that conversation as to what to put in there. Um, can you give me an example? Or can you give me a bit of a template to do this? Uh, the first thing that I say to them and the thing I'll rip start today by saying is that, no, I can't. Um, there may be templates, but realistically a media kit is something that's unique uh, to your station and it's something that should be constructed with that in mind. So today we're just gonna start with a bit of an introduction um, about Spots and Space and myself. I'll, I know we all love talking about ourselves, so I'll try and keep that to an absolute minimum. And then uh, we can get on to what I mean by a media kit and what is meant by a media kit, um, what its purpose is and why it's relevant and valuable for your station to, to invest some time into getting one ready. Then we're gonna talk about some things that are commonly found in media kits. Um, I've come across this in, in my two years at Spots and Space and even before, uh, things that we would potentially want to avoid um, when, when you're thinking about what a media kit should be for your station. Then we're going to look at um, what to include. So again, as I mentioned, there is no specific formula, but I'm going to talk to you guys about some of the uh, concepts and elements and things that you should consider including in, in your media kit and why to have that there and what role that those specific elements play. Then we'll talk about our favorite topic, not really, uh, that of numbers. So we often get asked by agencies and even other advertisers and about numbers. And it's there's a bit of a myth that it's super important, but also um, we'll talk to you about why not having any relevant numbers or having incorrect numbers can be quite detrimentary, uh, detrimental to what you're trying to achieve. I also get asked about rates and pricing all the time. Uh, what should our rates be? How should we price something? Um, We'll have a bit of a conversation about that uh, before going into Q&A. So just want to call this out from the beginning. My experience with uh, media kits and stations is working with agencies, um, and as I will go into introduction, with agencies, corporate organisations, and government. Um, you yourself will know what works best for your local community, what works best for your local advertisers. So towards the end, I'm really keen to have an open conversation with uh, that we can all learn from each other about what's worked well for you in the past. Uh, next slide, please, Danny. So as I said, we'll be uh, quite quick through this. Uh, Spots and Space was established about 27 years ago um, by Lee Hubbard, who some of you may know. Uh, we advocate for community radio to advertising agencies, government and corporates. And by this, we mean we want more stations considered for more campaigns um, and for all audiences of community radio to be considered for more campaigns. As uh, the national media sales representatives, we're working on increasing sponsorship revenue for the sector as a whole. So what I mean by this is increasing budgets for every campaign, um, increasing rates, also just making every advertiser ask the question, can we look at community radio for this campaign instead of just dismissing it from their, uh, their thought process, which is, which is something that we, that we certainly work with. So that's the things that we do and what we advocate for um, as an organization. Um, just briefly about myself, I used to be working uh, with commercial news media organisations across Australia and New Zealand uh, when I was at AAP. And it was, it was really interesting experience just to learn, um, learn what they did well, but also see some of the same challenges that, um, 
that sector faces when it comes to innovation and technology, um, something that's certainly not unique uh, across the board. So that, that was a, a good grounding in the media sector. I've also worked for um, digital marketing agencies, so the agency side of this conversation, um, working on delivering national campaigns, which gave, gives me a bit of an understanding around the type of things that they look for when they go through their media buying process and certainly helps uh, with the role here at Spots in Space. I, while I haven't worked in community radio in the past, I've certainly grown up listening to it and it's an absolute pleasure to be working uh, so closely with the sector and working with my passion of trying to increase revenue for the sector and watch it thrive. So uh, next slide, thanks, Penny. So yeah, this is, this is the ultimate question now. What are we talking about when we mean media kit? Now, there are certainly examples uh, and a lot of confusion where people, and there is, this is also called a media kit or a press kit where brands would necessarily put something together as a press release um, for journalists to report on or for it to get picked up in some form of media. Uh, another term for a media kit is what a station or any other publisher would, would have for advertisers to see um, and, and what it is is exactly as that first point says. It's just something that's easy to read, something that's visually compelling. Um, it's a concise document. So we certainly don't want anything more than two or three uh, A4 pages and or you know five or six PowerPoint slides if we want to do it in a slide deck format. And it gives an organization every reason to be working with your station. Um, it's not just about sponsorship for spots. So often, I mean, that's certainly what Spots and Space does, but in terms of your media kit, it should be encouraging spot purchases for sure, but also longer term brand associations. And we'll talk about why that's especially relevant um, a bit later on. It's a lot more low touch, and especially when you don't necessarily have a gigantic sales force, it's a much more efficient way to ensure consistent revenue for your station uh, with a little involvement on, on an ongoing basis. So a uh, media kit is an opportunity to showcase everything that's unique about your station. Not all stations are the same. Uh, we started off by saying that, and this is why not all media kits will be the same. And this is the opportunity. This is, this is to say why your station is special, why advertisers want to be working with your station, and to, um, why programs are special, why personalities, uh, why your community um, is that involved with your station and you're involved with your community. The engagement between that is absolutely important. A media kit is also a conversation starter and a supporting document. So, but by this, I mean, you want the media kit when you're having a conversation with a potential sponsor to, to talk to about certain things about the media kit. So you either lead with it and then follow up with a phone call or you're already in conversations and they're, they're already potentially considered working with um, your station. And that's, and that's the purpose of the media kit as well, to support the conversations you're already having, support the reasons for working with your stations that you've already communicated with them. And this is something they can take away and show other stakeholders within their business um, to validate the purchasing decision. A flashy media kit does not mean more sponsorship. Um, so I don't want anyone get walking away from here thinking they have to invest in a lot of money into getting something designed really well or looking uh, amazingly. There's certainly like a, a minimum level that you would want it to be at, but it's, it's about the, the substance of the media kit and the content of it more than anything else. But more so, people don't buy from the media kit. Um, they buy from the individual. So the person that's speaking to the person that's responsible for uh, sponsorship revenue, uh, they buy from the individual relationship and that personal connection. They buy the station. Um, they buy the programs, its personalities, its engagement with the community. And um, what the media kit does is it supports that buy-in decision. It doesn't create the decision, it definitely supports it. Um, next slide, please, Danny. Thanks. So as I mentioned earlier, we'll start off before we look at what should be included, just some of the things that um, I would encourage everyone to avoid uh, in their media kits. And we'll talk about why in, in the Q&A a bit later, if that's um, of interest. So I've come across uh, media kits that, have, that are essentially just a bunch on a Word document that has lots of text. That's certainly something that um, I can't use when presenting to agencies and certainly something that you wouldn't want your media kit to have. Sure, it, it may have the information that we're talking about later on, but it needs to be presented um, in a bit more of a visually appealing manner. And yeah, that's, that's that. Uh, in terms of uh, the 
information about rates and pricing. I would strongly recommend avoiding that. I would strong, strongly recommend putting any package rates out there. Um, the one exception to this is if you have a specific promotion or a, a month special or something like that, um, where you could consider including that for on a short-term basis, but certainly ongoing, it's not something I'd, I'd want to encourage. And again, we'll talk about um, why in later in this, in this uh, webinar. I've seen media kits that don't, don't mention anything about your programming or the station's programming or the personalities involved with the station. Um, it just says, hey, we broadcast in this area on this frequency. And, and that's really not saying anything that um, the purchaser, the sponsor doesn't already know. Uh, it's something that they can Google and easily find out. It's something that's probably on your website or on any other website they can find that from. So we, we really need the media kit to have something that, um, that goes up, up, up beyond just the basic information. And this last thing is um, quite important. Um, as I mentioned, the media kit is to support a uh, sponsor's purchasing decision for why they want to buy sponsorship on your station, whether it be spots or a longer term sponsor of a program or anything. And if there's no way after looking at the media kit for them to actually want to contact someone, if there's no phone number, no email, um, they have to actually go out of their way to find that. You know, that's just putting another barrier between them actually purchasing that sponsorship. So absolutely, we need to have um, some sort of call to action and contact details. And um, that certainly, it's an absolute minimum. The final point on here is numbers and statistics. So there's a slide here later that we'll talk about the role of numbers. Um, but one important thing is to just never have something that's either incorrect, so simply that's something that's untrue, or something that's irrelevant. So an example would be, someone saying you're the number one station in a location and then providing some sort of numbers about listening overnight. Um, sorry, I just thought of an example of the spot, but, but the numbers and statistics, statistics have to support the story you're uh, saying in the media kit. So if you are saying you have a great connection with a particular type of community, then support that. If you are saying you're the the number one uh, radio station in that particular region, support that. Uh, but, that but that's the final point on that, I guess. Um, Danny, next slide, thanks. So before we go into um, the different parts of a media kit and what you should consider, the main thing I wanted to drive home, and I'll repeat this again probably two, two or three times because it's very important, um, the media kit is a way to show potential sponsors and advertisers what they're buying. When, when I'm talking about what they're buying, I'm not talking about the numbers of people or um, this particular program or you know, a specific demographic that advertisers say that they're necessarily looking for. Uh, I'm talking about they're buying your station, they're, they're buying the opportunity to work with your station, to be branded with your station, to engage with your station's community. And in order to do that, that needs to be front and center um, of what your conversations with the potential sponsor are and also front and center of your media kit. So that's the first point, uh, which is your station is a community institution. So show that. What is your station story, its history, its significance to your community? Um, anything with a bit of history it evokes that nostalgic emotion, but not just when you're talking about it, because I'm, I'm sure you're passionate about where you, what your station's all about but also it would have that uh, emotion with the potential purchaser because they know they're really buying into something that's had some history that has that connection with the community. Um, the media kit's an opportunity to showcase that as well and your engagement with your community, whether it's OBs that you've done or events that you've had, or even I know um, a lot of community radio stations were quite prevalent in how they react to things like the bushfires and floods and even COVID-19. So talking to what you've done with some images, with some local uh, community members, those type of engagements and that type of uh, connection with your community is very valuable. And it's something that community radio does better than any other, um, any other media out there. So it's something that I, we would, I would like community radio media kits to certainly um, showcase because it is so very effective when a purchaser or media, media buyer looks at that and goes, okay, well, we may not have the statistics or the level of data that commercial radio has, but community radio isn't about that. It's about this, it's about the community and showcasing that on your media kit is important. 
social media is another thing that's um, it's something that we're all working out how to most effectively utilize, especially in a media kit, but also when we're having a conversation with advertisers. If you have a good social media presence, certainly link to it. Um, certainly, uh, maybe when I'm even talking, combine the two. So when you're talking about uh, your engagement with the community, you have a screenshot of a Facebook post of you doing that. So it, it links both the fact that you're active in, on social media with your audience and also with real life community. Aligned with the previous point, um, programs and personalities are your biggest, your biggest draw cards. They highlight what your station's all about. Your noble personalities are, could, could be community icons. And having them uh, front and center of your media kit, having them highlight and showcase what your station's all about. It's engagement to the community, sure, but done through these programs, through these personalities. That should be the basis, uh, or you might want to consider making that the basis of what this media kit will be about. Next stage, thanks, Danny. Next uh, slide, sorry. Aligned with what I was just saying a bit earlier about inviting the um, potential sponsor to be, understand what your station's all about, audio and video clips are very powerful. So whether it's a video of broadcasters sitting in the studio uh, doing a particular broadcast or video of just a, uh, a station tour or audio from a particular program that shows the sound of, um, of, of your station to a potential sponsor. Um, certainly from my perspective, when I'm working with state and national based sponsors and we have the privilege opportunity to show a bit of an audio clip of a community station and the sound of it to these, uh, to, to these advertising agencies, they're quite amazed and drawn in and see the appeal and see why it's different and see why it's not just like, why they can't compare like they would to commercial radio or other mediums that may have better statistics because it's a different uh, conversation. It sounds different. Your connection with the community is different. And that's something you can certainly showcase in, um, in the audio clip or a video clip. Also, as I mentioned, images and video of your studio, look, it may sound like it's boring. Every studio may look similar and you, you might think, why should I include that? But I think it's certainly a valuable thing to do because radio isn't something people can necessarily visualize and putting that image of where you're broadcasting from or your studio or um, individuals that make your, uh, your station run. It makes it a tangible thing. They're working with real people and a physical location. So certainly something to consider. Broadcast areas and coverage maps. Um, yeah, it's, I would say it's essential uh, to have it in there because more often than not, um, a lot of advertisers are certainly looking to, to the areas that you do cover, even if it's not a primary concern for them um, at, at some point along the, the road, when they have to validate why they're purchasing or, or buying sponsorship on, on your station, they'll have to validate, look, they've got some numbers somewhere, they've got this coverage map somewhere. So it's certainly helpful. And from my perspective for state and national advertisers, it's something that most of them ask about. So absolutely including that in your media kit is something you should consider doing. And the last point, um, before we go over, I'll, I'll, it's, it's similar to what I said before. It has to be a visually led design uh, with minimal text. And by that, I don't necessarily mean it has to be flashy. I, the content of your media kit absolutely will be the primary thing that matters, but it, it has to be at a certain level of visually appealing for them to digest that content. So that's why I put it last. It's not a major point. I certainly don't want anyone to walk away thinking they have to invest in designers or whatever else, but it has to be at a bare level. Next slide, please, Danny. So numbers. Um, we spoke about it before um, in the sense that a lot of potential sponsors may ask for numbers. A lot of conversations I have with state and national based advertising agencies and government request numbers um, and use it as a way to either say they don't want to work with, with your station, don't want to sponsor, or maybe to justify it. Realistically, if you're having a conversation about numbers on that granular level, something's not potentially gone as right as it could have before you got to there. And what I mean by that is, I would recommend you lead with the narrative and support it with data and insights. So when you're having your conversations about why they wanna be working with your station, because of all the stuff that we spoke about before, 
about your engagement with the community, why your station matters to your community, about your personalities that have this show that it's loved by everyone around, or this particular program that speaks to a particular audience that your potential sponsor or advertiser cannot, um, sponsor, I should say, cannot access any other way. So that's the narrative and the story you want to lead with. And the numbers and the data and insights are very important to support that. As I said, it exists to support the buy-in decision. It's not the primary factor, but a lack of numbers and a lack of data produces a lack of confidence. So even if um, the, the media planner wants to work with you and starts talking to you about, hey, let's look at you know, a longer-term brand partnership or maybe a two-month campaign with some spots, at somewhere along that conversation, um, it has to be somewhere along that conversation, it has to be validated with someone else who hasn't had that level of contact with your station. So the first person may have a relationship with an individual at your station or with someone representing your station, but that first person may recommend working with your station, but somewhere along they have to justify it or have a tick box and not having that data has that lack of confidence, not having that number to support their buying decision raises questions that you don't want to be raised and it falls over at the last uh, side. So while the numbers isn't the hero of the conversation, it certainly is required as a tick box, but also just to support the buying decision. And the final point is, yeah, it needs to be relevant, accurate, and current. Um, that may seem like a basic thing that I keep repeating, but I'm doing, doing that because I've often seen uh, our data statistics, irrelevant statistics, and sometimes just inaccurate statistics uh, people saying they reach more people than they do, or people maybe underselling themselves. So these are things to avoid because, again, just like numbers can support um, a, a good decision and a buying decision, finding out numbers that are inaccurate or irrelevant or maybe 10 years old at a, diff at a stage of that process can bring the whole conversation down as well. So um, all of that's important, but just to reiterate, you have to, they buy because of the individual, they buy because of the station. And the numbers are just a support. Uh, next slide, please, Danny. Yes, so rates and pricing. Um, again, have asked this, this question about where a station should be rate, uh, priced all the time. And that's certainly something we can dig into a bit deeper um, at the Q&A if it's of interest. But the main point I wanna get across from today's webinar is to not list them on your media kit if you can help it. Um, I say if you can help because there are exceptions and it's good ideas to potentially list them for a particular promotion as a short term uh, avenue. But for the most part, there is no context for any rates you're giving um, because as the media kit is. Um, so I just noticed some questions here. I'm going to pause for a second. Um, so how to get accurate stats on listener numbers? Well, I'll let um, someone from the CBAA potentially have that conversation with you later. Certainly, I think in terms of community broadcasting, that the work that they do about listenership is probably the best we can get. Um, it is the best we can get. And it has helped me in conversations with um, state and national based agencies having the uh, national listenership survey data uh, to speak to. But again, I'll let the CBAA um, have that conversation with you uh, later on, Susan. Um, but, but that's not to say that's the only source of numbers and that's not to say you can't use other numbers from, from other uh, locations as well, as, as long as it's particularly relevant and accurate and current. Um, to go back to, sorry, I just noticed other questions. Um, James, yeah, I think um, this is being recorded uh, from what Danny mentioned, uh, so it should be available online later. To go back to uh, rates on the media kit, um, so yeah, don't include them because there's no context. They're buying from the individual's conversation with the other individual. So that conversation isn't recorded on the media kit. It's the media kit separate to that. And also if you just put rates out there, there's no reason for them to know why the rates exist or what the rates even mean. And as I said, people buy from people and you wanna encourage the conversation. Having rates on there means they don't pick up the phone and call you and they don't, enable you to have that conversation where you can talk to them about more than just spot. You can talk to them about uh, various ways to work with each other, which I'll talk about in a second. So in terms of pricing, um, it's usually set by supply and, supply and demand factors and availability. So if your five minutes is not full, 
you can lower your rates. If finance is full, you can increase them. But realistically, that's that's difficult to track, difficult to do without a sales force that is constantly seeing what what's available, what's not, and it's constantly out there changing rates and having those conversations. And these days, even commercial organizations, and I've seen some demos of this, have sophisticated uh, tracking systems and programmatic technology that have real-time bidding for particular spots. We don't want to get into that. Uh, one, I don't think uh, I don't think that's something that's particularly relevant because we don't want to we don't want to have the conversation about reach and frequency and numbers necessarily because that we want to talk about why they're buying into our communities. So a much simpler approach would be well, there's two specific approaches. Um, one just have spot rates for short-term campaigns. Now these campaigns are by potential sponsors that want to get on there for a particular reason for one to three months. Uh, or even less maybe, let's go two weeks to three months. They wanna either increase awareness or have a particular conversion or call to action to do something. And you can work with them. You can work with them and say, look, if you do this, we'll give you this many bonus, bonus spots, or I wouldn't recommend changing your rates. I'd recommend keeping your rates the same and negotiating on the amount of bonus spots you can give them. Um, because once you change your rates and drop it to a certain point, and if that gets out, you're not gonna have the ability to necessarily have conversations with others about, higher or you make it you have a more difficult conversation if once you've dropped your rates and that becomes public so i would suggest keeping spot rates uh, fairly standard potentially reviewing them every year um, and reviewing them to go up or if you need to go down but if it, keep it stagnant or up i would say and have that conversation with the potential advertiser for a particular campaign for the campaign's objectives and talk to them about how you can support them with additional bonus spots the second thing is more uh, something I want to spend a bit more time on. It, it's certainly for stations that don't have a huge sales force, a much better way to go about working with sponsors um, is creating the longer term associations and partnerships. And every uh, potential sponsor that will speak to you about working with you on a short term campaign can potentially also be a longer term uh, sponsor. That's just up to the individual. And maybe we can do a different session at some point around how you have those conversations, what conversations um, should be had to convert that. But number two is realistically the low touch, high return, um, the low touch, high return uh, sponsors that you want. Ones that work with your brand for like with your station for uh, six to 12 months that have a strong association with your stations and you review them every now and then you, you like you have it, you build a relationship over years and you give them a lot of value from that. So you, you let them uh, maybe sponsor a particular program or I'm not sure, there's, there's so many different uh, variables you can include in that, but that's what you really wanna focus on because the short-term ones will come and go. And unless you have a sales force that's keeping on top of them, um, it's, not, it's gonna be a lot of uh, high contact for not that much uh, in terms of revenue coming through. So uh, next slide, please, Danny. Finally, because I really want to get to Q&A and I realize we've talked for a little while. Um, the key takeaways are the media kit isn't the primary decision-making tool for media buyers, but it does support and validate the buying decision. So it's very important to have a, a media kit that you've uh, spent some time on and reflects your station. You, it, It's used to promote your station, its personalities, its programs, it, and its connection with your community. Uh, refrain from including rates, pricing information uh, on your media kit. Um, there are some exceptions for that, as I mentioned, like specific promotions. And invite the conversation whenever possible um, and explore options for longer term partnerships with the client. Um, that's all I'll finish with um, and we'll go to some Q&A. And hopefully, and hopefully, as I mentioned, please share anything that's worked well for you um, in, in your community as well and with your station. Thank you, Santosh. That was wonderful. Uh, Betty from 897, we'll get her to start this off, asks, we know that some statistics and data can be outdated quickly. How would you set up a media kit to have all your KPIs, data, statistics uh, churned to a minimum? And how frequently should the media kit be reviewed? It's a good question. Um, so who was that? Was that Betty? That was Betty, yes. Uh, that's a good question, uh, Betty. So just to... How so? The parts of the question that I caught there, Danny. Sorry, I missed the beginning. Was how frequently it should be reviewed? What was the beginning of the question? 
That was the second half of the question was how frequently should the media kit be reviewed? Uh, the first part was just uh, keeping in mind that statistics and data obviously can become outdated quickly. Yep. How would you sort of set up your media kit to make sure that uh, it was showing up-to-date accurate information and how frequently should it be updated? So, again, I would be uh, minimalistic with, with data. I would not necessarily... Um, Thanks, thanks, Steve. Uh, so I would not necessarily um, go into and list 10 different statistics that you need to uh, support and change all the time. As I mentioned, the statistics are there to be like, has to be accurate, relevant, and current. So the relevant, relevant factor of the statistics is to pick and choose what data supports the story you're telling in your media kit. And that's going to be different for every media kit and for every station. So I, I would a way to make sure it doesn't become too arduous of a task is to not use all the data you have available to you. Certainly keep that in reserve if someone asks for that deeper, but 99.9% of the time they won't. Um, but on your media kit, highlight the three or four sets of data, or maybe even two or three that support the story you're saying. So again, so what you're monitoring is not that much, only so two or three. And in terms of how often it should be reviewed and refreshed, again, that's this is just me giving a, a rough guide but you can you can certainly update it faster. I would say six months, um, every every six months or so, just to check if you have more recent information. If you don't have more updated information than in a six month period, then you just go with what you have. I think when I'm talking about not current, I'm talking about things that are potentially eighteen months, two years old plus. Excellent. I've got a couple of questions from uh, Facebook that I'll put forward to you. Um, these are both uh, from Craig at Plenty Valley FM. G'day, Hi, Craig. Craig. Um, his first one is, and I might sort of do a bit of answering this one, can you tag businesses you would like to engage with through social media, even if they aren't current sponsors without breaching guidelines to attract their initial interest? I can let you know that is not necessarily a breach of uh, sponsorship legislation. I'd say it's just you sort of reaching out. Santosh, however, might be able to provide a bit more advice as to whether that's a good strategy. That's a, that's a good question. It's, uh, and I love the creativity um, when you're thinking about things like that. Now, it just, this depends on the sales conversation you want to be having and what your sales overall tra sales strategy and approach is. I would recommend doing that if you're already in conversation with the particular business. So I wouldn't go out of your way. Um, I wouldn't go out of your way to, to do that without just do that cold so you should already be having a conversation with those businesses it, sh it should be or so maybe someone that you know in that business already so it's it's not from out of the blue and those type of engagements and interactions are like in, a, in essence like the media kit they're supporting what you already do they're not the reason why anyone would do anything but it's certainly a good thing to do and consider if you're already in conversations with them Excellent. The second part of his question is, what's the easiest way to reach the best available per uh, person who would make a purchasing decision? Are there any buzzwords we should use? Ah, uh, that's, I feel like any answer to this question, Danny, would not be doing it justice because it requires a lot of time and like in probably another session to go into uh, that specifically. But I'll try and be brief. And again, as I said, Craig, like, please feel free to give me a call later. We can chat or we'll have another session later. But um. The best way to find out who would be making that purchasing decision is to do a bit of research on your own end first, depending on the organization you want to you want to contact. It varies from the size of organizations to obviously a small business. It'd be uh, someone in a managerial position because there won't be a sales team or there won't be a, a media buying team, I should say. Um, but if you're working with agencies, that's different again. How to best ask is just to come up to introduce, to introduce who you are and what you do and ask to speak to someone that you can talk to about working with their brand uh, because, and then they'll put you on to someone who is responsible for their brand being out there in public. And then you can, you can start having the conversation. They may not be the right person, but you can dig a bit deeper. Again, it all depends on the type of organization you're trying to reach. And I can be a bit more specific if there was an example. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And Craig's joining us via Facebook today. Just to remember, if you can't connect with us, uh, via the webinar platform, you can always check out our regularly scheduled webinars on Facebook. I'm just wheeling back to Susan's question there. How do others get accurate stats on listener numbers? On my screen at the moment is the Community Radio Listeners Survey, which is available from the CBAA uh, website. 
I'm just going to go into the audience summary now. Now, a lot of this stuff is very broad. You sort of can get national numbers there. Uh, then you can get a few key markets in there. Uh, Susan, depending on where your station is located, I'd be able to provide you with a bit more information about the possible options that might be available to you if you're sort of in one of those big metropolitan areas. You are in a position where you're able to um, get some of the numbers from the National Listener Survey. Uh, if you're from a, a smaller area, the CBAA is able uh, to equip stations um, with surveys where the stations can go out themselves and survey their audiences. Now, obviously, it's a big commitment for me to show you that screen at the moment because it also means that I'm showing you all of the many tabs that I have open. That's an insight into my soul that I don't think people necessarily want. Um, so, yeah, but if you want to know more about that, send us an email, uh, danny.chifley at cbaa.org.au. There's a question there uh, from, I think, James from Inner FM asking if, if this will be available online later on. Yes, indeed, it will. Uh, now, moving forward to a few more questions. Brendan asks, I understand you can't provide a template, but is it possible to see an example of a successful media kit? Um, I'll jump in on this one as well, Santosh, in the first instance. Uh, some stations do have their media kits available, and as part of the follow-up correspondence that we'll send out to people here at the webinar afterwards, we'll link you to where those media kits exist online. We've also got some um, resources from back in the day there from the CBAA about media kits. But I think sort of their kits that obviously tell that specific station story, and just to reiterate the points that Santosh has been making, I guess they're probably all right to be having a look at to sort of see a general idea of how it looks, but it's very much up to you to tell your station story uh, according to your station. I'm not misquoting you there, am I, Santosh? No, that's absolutely right. And that's why I always balk at the idea of trying to provide examples because, one, I don't want to highlight or say, this station is really great because it's picking one station. I'm sure lots of stations do it really well. But also beyond that, um, it's almost very it's not that relevant because it's that it's great for that particular station um it may not necessarily be great for your station but if you're wondering about how to structure it how to position it um it's it's something for like a designer to potentially talk to you about but like from my perspective you can be quite simplistic in it in the approach in terms of start with um talking about your engagement with the community then talk about some key programs have images of key personalities have audio clips in there have video clips in there keep it to two pages and yeah so that that's the best i can go in terms of how would you what would it look like or a template look like but to reiterate what danny said it's very specific to your station and without knowing what your station is about it's it's difficult to answer we are happy to send you uh what we can and i think uh someone in there james from redcliffe is tagging in from susie's question there in regards to the listener statistics he's saying for you from redcliffe in queensland i think i might be able to provide you uh, with a bit more information and indeed as part of the follow-up correspondence we send to everyone we will include links to uh further resources there uh for surveys research and the like D, Vitamin D asks, are we allowed to promote our sponsors on social media? Sure are. Um, it is one of those things. Sorry, Santosh, to jump in again. I just thought I'd check this one because of the, um, I think the, the barrier here or the thing that people are concerned about is that there is um, breach, potential breaches of sponsorship. That's not really the case. It's just one of those things where, um, it's fine for you to engage with people online. And I think it's probably a clever thing because it means that you're able to bolster your existing on-air sponsorship with being able to sort of say, oh, you know, we'll be supporting you online and on social media. Uh, just with all activities uh, that we do where uh, money intersects with our role as community broadcasters, we just have to ensure that we're able to show everyone that we're operating as a not-for-profit. Yeah. Um, so it's obviously a bit more nuanced than that and able to have that lengthy conversation with people should they have it. But as it stands, it's uh, no worries at all. Many stations have listed on their websites their list of station sponsors where people can, where they're able to link to that sort of stuff. Uh, thank you, Dee, for that. Uh, Brendan, we asked your, Brendan used both the Q&A. So sorry to cut you off there, Danny, just to, just to go back to Dee's uh, question there. 
um, it's doing those type of um, associations and sponsorships is certainly another way to really increase the value of the brand, so the longer term relationships with your stations. Um, and, and the more that you do things like that and the more value that like one sponsor can see or a potential sponsor can see that the existing sponsor is getting, you're better, you, it places you in a better state to have those conversations about any future sponsors about how they can work with you longer term. Sorry. Thanks. And Paul Price asks the million dollar question. Do you have tips on how to set pricing? Um, yeah. Basically, Paul, it, again, it's very unique to the station. It depends on how much of your five minutes are you filling up, but also how much of the sales effort do you have in doing so? Um, so that's, those will be the two factors you, you think about when you set your pricing. I'll keep it very simple. I will keep it to uh, setting your 30 second pricing and keeping 15, 45 as multipliers of that 30 second rate. And you may have a more expensive rate if it has to be just breakfast. Um, it can be a standard rate for run a station or BMADE. And where you would sort of put that, have a look into um, your listenership numbers, have a look into how much of your five minutes you're already filling up. Think about if you do reduce your pricing or are you going to just lose more money? Because if you don't, if you look, consider reducing your pricing, but you don't have a sales effort to try and fill up more of your five minutes, then you, you may do that. So it may be better off keeping it where it is and keeping it at the level that it is. So again, it's a very nuanced question, but those are the things that you should be thinking about when you're doing that, but it's very individual to your station. So the market will sort of set the price as to what the sponsorship would be? In a sense, but it, it, for community radio, I would recommend you, you just pay less attention to that and more, more to keeping it what it is and then reinforcing why it's valuable to work with your station. Um, or by keeping it what it is, I mean, keeping it reasonable as well. So you don't want to walk down the, the road and, and be at the same level as a commercial station or something else like that. So it has to be reasonable. Um, or, you, or you may want to do that if, if in your market you have the largest number of listeners. So the, any data will help, help with that as well. Excellent. And there's obviously nothing wrong with you liaising with other community stations of similar sizes serving similar communities. If you need a connection with any of them to have these sort of chats, please feel free to let us know. We are more than happy to do so. Um, I think that's all the questions answered for the moment. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, so there's one more I think we've missed, Danny. Um, I'm just going to get to it quickly, if that's OK. No worries, mate. Uh, so James asked, uh, tagging off his question on the subject of listing numbers, if you can't get accurate stats without spending huge amounts of money, how would you convey this to potential sponsors without sounding uh, like a bit of a tin pot? I'm just going to answer it quickly because this is something I have to obviously in my position do all the time and when I work with you know national advertisers to go can you give us this uh, specific data that they are used to getting from every other source and obviously we can't uh, at the moment provide that level of data that they would have and the answer to that is you just say we are a community-based organization uh, uh, you know we're volunteer run we're not for profit and this is what we have access to but you know, it's not just about the numbers, it's about what you're getting that goes beyond the numbers, you're getting this engagement with the community and it takes you back to the first part of the story that should be front and center of your media kit or any other conversation, which is, which is your community is important, your station is important for your community and engages with the community that goes beyond just what any data can show. That's all. And obviously I'm not in a position to answer questions without sounding a bit tin pot as anyone who was here <laughs> at the start of today's session can attend to because I was there for about 15 minutes saying, oh, how does webinars work? What does this plugin do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, Betty's asking, I'm asking, uh, Betty, I can uh, hopefully answer a bit of your question there. I can send some stuff through to you. Um, uh, just if anyone's got any last questions they want to put into the chat box or the Q&A box, please feel free to do so. We will have to wrap this up soon. Um, I'd love to thank Santosh for uh, coming and taking part in today's session. Santos, where's the best place for stations who aren't already acquainted with spots and space to connect? You can give us a call, Danny, on 02809077711 or send her an email to media at spotsandspace.com.au and either myself or one of our team will get in touch and start having that conversation. And I'll, uh, I will provide contact details for Santos as part of um, the uh, materials that we'll send out to all registrants at the end of today's session. 
Um, we'll also include the video just in case you missed anything. Coming up, Better Together, Volunteering in Community Broadcasting. That's uh, Tuesday, 17th of May, 2022 for our next webinar. Um, that's part of National Volunteer Week and we're really happy to be having guests from Volunteering Australia who'll be joining us for that one. Uh, we'll be talking about attracting new volunteers to your station, um, how you can make sure that you're keeping your current volunteers engaged and happy, and also a bit of stuff about volunteering in a post-pandemic world. Anything we discuss at the moment has to do with that post-pandemic world. Um, but of course, also, we're aware that the election was called on the weekend, so there might be the call between today's webinar and our next webinar that's there on the screen at the moment for us to have a webinar about engaging with politicians, making sure that we're all aware of the rules and regulations in regards to any election promotion uh, that might be there on air and just sort of making sure that stations are doing as much advocacy on behalf of their station as is possible with their politicians in their area. Um, the CBAA, as with everything else, will be letting you know about that. Uh, we're not just sending out correspondence to you about Community Radio Plus, which is available now. Hopefully everyone's station is there uh, on the app. Um, if you're experiencing uh, sort of uh, any difficulties with the app or you've got any further questions, 02-9310-2999 is the number to call. That's 02-9310-2999. Otherwise, we're hoping that your audiences have you on their wirelesses, their transistors, and also their mobile phones, and on so much more. That's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Thank you so much to Santosh um, for leading today's session. Absolutely wonderful stuff. Uh, my name has been Danny Chifley. I will be in touch with you all again very, very soon on behalf of the Community Broadcasting Association of Australia. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. You take care now. See you soon, and don't forget to fill out that feedback. <laughs>